10 film by Shirai Shikoji, six teenage girls visit a derelict school to make a wish before the altar of Shirome, a mysterious and wrathful spirit that appears as a butterfly whose wings have two large circles that look like white eyes. Legend has it that Shirome will grant a wish, but only if intent is pure. If Shirome judges the desire otherwise, the spirit will curse the asker and untimely death is sure to follow. The six girls are all members of the pop idol singing and dancing group Momokuro. They muster up their courage to enter the school to ask Shirome to grant them a spot on the high profile year end televised singing contest, Kohaku Utagasen. The contest is an annual battle between musicians divided into red and white teams based on gender. Kohaku Utagasen is a real event that broadcasts every year on New Year's Eve in Japan. Momokuro is also a real teen idol performance group. Despite its pretense of found footage stylization in the guise of documentary film production, the events of the film are not real, nor is the legend of Shirome. In her article on the film, Professor Lindsay Rebecca Nelson unpacks the formal construction of reality in Shiraishi's mockumentary production. Her work draws connections between the performativity of emotions expressed by the girls as they face their fears to the performativity of emotions that is the very basis of the pop idol persona. In this video, Professor Nelson expands on the genre of found footage horror and its relationship to the idol industry in Japan. She discusses the techniques and style of the mockumentary genre, the construction of realism and how that resonates with the relationship between idol and fan, and the underlying social concerns that simmer beneath the surface of Shiraishi's Shirome. Hello, I'm Colleen Laird. It's my great pleasure today to speak with Professor Lindsay Nelson, a scholar of Japanese film and popular culture. Lindsay Nelson received her PhD in comparative literature from the University of Southern California. Her dissertation focused on the figure of the monstrous child in Japanese literature and film. She has lived, worked, and studied in Japan for a total of 16 years and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Economics at Meiji University in Tokyo. Her research focuses on Japanese horror films, Japanese popular culture, and Japanese horror-focused visual culture. Her recent publications include Embracing Abjection, Reclaiming Agency, New Possibilities for the Zombie and the Social Recluse in Meat of the Living Dead. This is in Studies of the Humanities. Also, Cinema at the Edge of the World, Visions of Precarity in the Films of Kazuyoshi Kumakiri in Japanese Visual Media, Politicizing the Screen, which is edited by Jennifer Coates and is forthcoming in 2021. And her first book, Circulating Fear, Japanese Horror, Fractured Realities, and New Media is forthcoming from Lexington Books in 2021. Today, we're gonna to be discussing an article which also uh, will appear in the book, the forthcoming book, Choosing Illusion, Mediated Reality, and the Spectacle of the Idol in Koji Shiraishi's Shirome. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to start out just really to start the conversation with a question that is about personal passion and intellectual passion. So I know that you're a horror fan. Um, what drew you to the particular subset of found footage horror? So I think um, when it comes to being interested in horror, uh, I've always been really interested in the concept of reality and authenticity and how it's constructed. Um, and in particular, I've been drawn to horror movies that basically center around the question of what is real, where central characters wonder, you know, is this all in my head? Is this a dream? Um, and, and found footage horror is a big part of that. And I think uh, before I was interested in Japanese found footage horror, I was just interested in found footage horror in general because it definitely deals with the construction of, of reality and authenticity. And then when it comes to Japanese found footage horror, I think part of it was because when people think of J-horror, they don't immediately imagine found footage. Um, it, it's not really the first thing that comes to mind, but uh, true ghost stories and the question of you know, what is real or uh, fiction within these narratives have definitely been a part of Japanese media and Japanese horror media for a long time, um, but it hasn't really been explored as much uh, as the more famous Japanese horror films. So I think that's, that's kind of what I was interested in. 
I, I think that's true. Um, I don't think that many people have probably heard of this film outside of Japan, right? So it's sort of yeah. um, this whole genre that I think people would be really interested in, but it's definitely not marketed in the same way. So now that we're talking about the film in particular, so what inspired you to write specifically about Shiro? So I found Shiro made by accident um, when I was just kind of searching through, you know, uh, little known or, or random films and then looking uh, for something for a new project. Um, and when I first uh, read the description of it, and I first learned about it, I just thought that it was a, a vehicle, you know, for this <laughs> pop group, um, which is very common in Japan, you know, uh, famous pop stars or pop groups will make movies um, or documentaries uh, that are basically just promotional vehicles. Um, but then uh, when I watched it, I was intrigued because it, it is obviously still a vehicle, but there's a lot going on as well. And I was surprised by the layers that it had and by the the kind of interesting questions that it seemed to be asking <laughs> about uh, performativity and, and reality and authenticity. And, and this particular director, um, I had seen some of his other films that, that dealt with kind of similar questions. Um, so, you know, I guess it wasn't surprising that he was dealing with them here. I think also I've always been interested in idol culture, uh, even though it's, it's not my primary area of, of research. And there are a lot of other people who've done a lot of better <laughs> um, things with idol culture than me. Um, but I, in particular with idol culture, I've always been struck by uh, the, the different kinds of illusions um, and the different versions of reality that exist within idol culture. And so it was a, a sort of, you know, uh, light bulb where it was like, oh, there, there's an overlap here <laughs> between uh, found footage horror and idol culture in terms of uh, constructing reality um, and uh, kind of presenting these illusions for consumption um, to different kinds of audiences. It's nice when those things intersect that you're like the yeah. intersections of interest come together. It's really nice. Right. Um, so I want to talk about this, uh, this role of artifice and hopefully we'll also get to some of these layers too that you've already mentioned. Um, so in your article specifically, you talk about the role of artifice both in the film and in the idol industry as you've, as you've already mentioned. Um, so I have actually a couple of questions <laughs> on this point. Um, can you, in your article, you specifically say that Shirome is a quote, piece of media dressed up to look real. Um, and I think that's absolutely on the nose. I think that's true. <laughs> but I'd like for you to impact for my students how Shirome uses film techniques specifically to convey this sense of authenticity or realism. I, I think this is a, a classic feature of found footage horror and mockumentary. Um, of course, you know, th th this is also a genre of comedy. I think if you look at uh, certain kinds of, of uh, movies like Spinal Tap or something, you know, that pretend to be documentaries. And um, so this is a, a piece of media that uh, makes use of certain kinds of editing, certain mm -hmm. kinds of uh, sound effects or lack of sound editing. Um, that makes use of certain kinds of uh, camera angles and camera movement um, and uh, certain costuming choices uh, and a distinct lack of script or at least the feeling that there is no script. Um, and all of these uh, choices work together to make the audience feel that they're watching something very rough, um, something unpolished, uh, something that you know, maybe you just found on a shelf uh, <laughs> that was um, just, you know, a, a collection of footage uh, that was, you know, filmed in service of, of this uh, sort of documentary that these people were making. But of course, uh, none of that is true. Um, all of those things are choices. Uh, these are conscious choices that are designed to make the film look cheap, uh, to make it look uh, awkward or unpolished. And um, so I think to me that that sort of disconnect between, um, you know, oh, this is this is rough. This is, uh, you know, unpolished when in fact it's actually very curated uh, and very carefully uh, shaped to produce the reaction that you would have if you were watching something 
that was rough and unedited. When I, yeah, when I think about found footage horror, the first thing that comes to my mind sort of historically is the Blair Witch Project. And so may, maybe you have an idea of something that came before it, but that to me is sort of like the first uh, big exposure of found footage horror. And, and if, it's been a while since I've seen that film, but the shaky camera, I think, that tries to give the aspect of documentary or speaking directly into the camera, right? Um, and things that are, um, I think unpleasant, sort of like the crying or dripping yeah. saliva. It's not. <laughs> oh, yes, that's what it is. Um, yeah. Really lends itself to the idea that it's not polished. And when I was watching Shirome, it struck me that it wasn't even trying to create like a Blair Witch style verisimilitude, but like going out of its way to try and suggest <laughs> that this is real and not fake. So. I think of the camera positions, you know, using the three cameras at one time or having a mirror shot where you have a camera in the mirror, but then very carefully having the real camera that's being used not in the mirror, right? So these selective choices or the boom mic that keeps coming yeah. in. Yeah, the selective choices of what we see and don't see. So this movie is very careful to show us certain things, like to show us the camera in the background, to show us the boom mic, uh, to show us the director, um, or the, the handlers uh, of the, the pop group. Um, but yeah, there's a ton that we don't see. <laughs> um, we don't see the actual camera that is filming uh, so much of this. We don't see that actual camera person. Um, and uh, of course we don't see the editing process or anything like that. Um, and that to me goes back to something that Alexander Heller Nicholas talks about in her book about found footage horror, where she says that Found footage today is very much a style and a genre and not a marker of authenticity. So perhaps in the Blair Witch days or even the pre-Blair Witch days when you had uh, movies like Cannibal Holocaust and, and uh, these, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is you know, a kind of dark title, but it, and it was controversial because they actually thought that it was, you know, a documentary about cannibals, but it wasn't. Um, but at that time, there was still the sense that this could be real. Um, you know, the, the Blair Witch Project was released uh, with maybe the very first viral marketing campaign. And even though, you know, people knew it was a movie, there was still a little bit of uncertainty. Like, oh, what am I watching? Whereas now, that uncertainty is gone. Uh, we know when we're watching found footage horror that we're watching fiction, but we immediately recognize the trappings of the genre. We immediately, when we see the shaky camera, when we see the intertitles, uh, mm -hmm. When we see the confessional, we that gives us the comfort of aha! I, I know what kind of movie I'm watching right now. So Shidome definitely does that as well. Um, it yeah. it gives us the trappings of the genre to tell us what kind of feature we're watching, and those are also interestingly, I think, the trappings of certain kinds of Japanese TV segments. Uh -huh. uh, so this is also dressed up to look like um, you know a variety bangumi, a, a variety TV show. Uh, ghost story segment um, where people are taken to a haunted school and then at the very end there's a dokiri, you know this kind of a sign that comes up that says it was a joke and yeah. <laughs> so so that's familiar I think to a lot of Japanese audiences as well. Interesting to bring up the idea of familiarity because familiarity it seems like oh this is this is knowable this this makes me feel comfortable but of course we're dealing with something that's trying to make you feel very uncomfortable so there's an yeah. <laughs> interesting juxtaposition there. Um, I think also about the staging in the film and I think this is probably one of the bigger give giveaways not just camera placement but you know the fact that everybody when they're scared they run to just the right place right there's never <laughs> they know how to hit their mark yeah. <laughs> they know how to hit their mark um, yep. something something that we may not think about or may not be so um, obvious at first, but it's there, right? Um, yes. So do you have any favorite scenes in the mm. film that really um, I think I talk about this a little bit in, in the article, but um, the scene in the dressing room uh, where oh. the girls confess into the camera, uh, and then there's a blackout, you know, mm. and they all scream, and then we cut to uh, a little bit later. Um, and this scene is so telling for me because uh, leading up to this scene, there's a moment where the director tells all of the girls, basically he uses the word honne, you know, the, the, your truth. And he says, you know, please express your truth mm. uh, to the camera. And so then we get a series of, you know, kokuhaku or like kind of confessions uh, where the girls all make a big show of being honest, you know, and saying, <laughs> basically saying some version of, I'm really scared, I'm really nervous, but, 
this is my job, so I'm gonna do my best, you know, make the little fists and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best for for the group and for everybody. And just the fact that like you know, they use the word honne, they use the word truth, but mm. this is so clearly rehearsed. Um, this is clearly something that these girls have said many times before. If you know anything about idol culture, uh, this is a script that, that idols frequently say, you know, oh, it's suffering, it's been so hard, but for the fans, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so it's very, very rehearsed. Um, and also, at the same time, they're not lying. They're not making it up whole cloth. They're just playing up their emotions. And this is another thing that happens a lot in idol culture when you see, uh, you know, graduation ceremonies or something where uh, people will be crying, they'll mm -hmm. be very emotional. And those emotions are not fake. They do feel those emotions, but they are also feeding off of the audience reaction and they're giving the audience uh, what they want. Uh, to hear. And so I think the other really interesting detail in that scene is that we have the one uh, member of the group, uh, Akari Hayami, uh, who's in the background making a big show of fidgeting and just, <laughs> oh, I really don't, I don't know what's going on here. And, and she is clearly the one who was given the most acting to do yeah. uh, because, yeah. you know, she's the one who says, oh yeah, I know who Shirome is. And, Shirome is made up. There's no way she could know who Shirome is. Um, so she's really playing up her discomfort mm -hmm. uh, more than the others. So I think there's just, yeah, a lot, a lot of layers of uh, uh, truth, lie, reality, authenticity, performativity going on in that scene. Yeah, it's, now that you mentioned that, it seems to me that idol culture, the emphasis there is on performance, right? So there's sort of an, an idea that they're performing, there's a performativity to it, but they are acting, right? And mm -hmm. so acting actors feel the emotions that they're, <laughs> that they're acting, yeah. right? So it's not, it's not actually that surprising. It's not fake. It's not that they don't yeah. feel those things. Yeah, they and, are and acting. Even, yeah, the word fake is really tricky, I think, in these mm -hmm. kinds of situations, because, I mean, Shiraishi himself, like in his little textbook that he wrote, he, he actually mm -hmm. uses the word fake, like fake documentary mm -hmm. is the title of his, his book. Um, but it's not quite the same. I think that uh, M Michelle Ho has a, a really interesting uh, article about this where she talks about, uh, she does work on K-pop fandom, mm -hmm. and uh, she talks about one of her informants um, who used to work for an agency uh, that represented a lot of K-pop stars, but th this woman herself was also a fan. Mm -hmm. And she eventually said that she had to quit working because she didn't want to see her idol's real selves. Mm. Um, and she said it was depressing for her when she would see them around the office, just chilling and, you know, without their persona and just kind of looking bored or something. And so I think that points to the idea that for a lot of fans, the true self or seeing the real self is not necessarily desirable. Um, right. What they want is the performance. What they right. want is the glitter and, and uh, you know, the the shiny version of things. Um, and idols, I think, are very aware of that. And so uh, they try to maintain that persona at all times. So this, I'm, I'm getting back to this idea for performativity or that we've been talking about of uh, idol emotionality and spectacle. Um, in this case, it's heightened particularly through the vehicle of terror. Um, and it's linked to this idea of devotion and pure love, which is the relationship between idols and their audiences, as you've just said, and audiences, you know, really wanting the glossy, <laughs> glossy picture, like that's preferable. Um, so on that note of performance uh, for the camera, performing emotions, being idols, I was really struck by the two performance numbers at the end of the film. So we have this uh, first performance number that happens in for Shirome, <laughs> right? This, a this acapella number that they do. Um, and then we have an actual live event uh, performance where they're performing for those fans. So I was wondering about your thoughts about the juxtaposition of these two performance sequences, especially since yeah. they, they come so close in the film. Yeah, right? yeah, they do. They do. Like, it seems like we're trying to get somewhere with a juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah. I think what's, what's remarkable to me is that there's kind of very little difference between those two performances it, on a basic level, like even though one of them is ostensibly taking place in a haunted school mm. when the girls are extremely stressed out and in a state of terror and the other one is much more polished and is in front of an audience and they're wearing flashy costumes and stuff. 
if you look at their manner and you know the the mood of, of the performances they're very similar uh the one in the school the girls are very upbeat they're doing their choreography they're you know smiling and happy and when the music falters a bit or, or you hear the rattling sounds or something they kind of pause for a second but then uh there's a, an immediate chorus of you know oh no, oh, no, we gotta keep going we gotta keep going um so yeah i think that was um what was surprising most to me was that even though these these performances take place in radically different contexts uh they're kind of the same <laughs> um, and the, the emotion uh is is kind of the same and uh i think if anything the, the similarity the similarity just highlights how ingrained uh performativity is uh for idols um it's not a stretch it's not fake for them it's just another facet of who they are yeah i was thinking i was really thinking about these two things as scenes and how the performances are basically the same and in one case and you have this layering of idols i think you have the idol group then you have shirome who's a kind of idol um, yeah, yeah, right <laughs> in its in his its whatever <laughs> own right um and this idea of of purity, which is hilarious, right? They have to have a pure intention and a pure wish. Oh, yeah. There's which... so many things I could say about <laughs> pure, purity and idol culture. And if I if I were a uh, more proficient scholar of Buddhism, I'm sure I could <laughs> go oh. into it more detail. But wow, yeah. <laughs> so I am sort of going there with this, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, the irony of their pure wish, of course, is that they they want to get on. Yeah. <laughs> A TV show yeah, and they right. want to make money and they want to be famous yeah. um, and so yeah. it's, it's an incredibly un maybe that's why they're haunted eventually who knows yeah <laughs> maybe that's the suggestion is you weren't yeah. so pure after all um, right yeah but then when you have the other performance you have these um, these fans who are kind of also performing so it, it's like this juxtaposition performing for Shirome then you're performing mm. for your fans mm. your fans are sort of also judging you whether or not you're pure right because the <laughs> idol is also supposed to be pure um, right. but then within the audience you have this one fan who's clearly like having, ecstasy. <laughs> he's, he's having some sort of emotional takeover yeah. that right. doesn't right. look good you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. look um it's almost if Shirome has cursed him, right? It seems mm -hmm. like it's a very yeah. traumatic, uh, near-death right. experience that he's having. So I was thinking about the layers of that, mm -hmm. of, of are, are, <laughs> is this idol group, are they Shirome, right? Are they? Yeah. Uh, and I noticed yeah. that you have all these um, production lights, stage lights behind mm -hmm. them in the sequence. And there's a couple mm -hmm. of them, especially when the, the, the young guy is having his moment um, where it's just too bright lights yeah. behind them so it's almost like yeah. shirome behind them <laughs> right yeah I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you thought about the yeah Hiroshi Ayagi talks a little about it, this a little bit just the idea of idols being kind of like Miko like shrine mm -hmm. maidens who mm -hmm. are able to cleanse fans mm -hmm. um, and and he talks about how a lot of fans see them this way they see them as kind of um, goddesses or you know uh, pure pure beings who have the potential to cleanse the world uh with their innocence and their purity which is all kinds of creepy um but <laughs> uh <laughs> i think this is one thing that doesn't get talked about is the, the fetishization of the, the purity of, of 12 yeah. 13 year old girls yeah. yeah um but uh yeah i think that um the idea in this movie too is that you know the, their wish being pure them being pure um, it, it isn't really defined exactly what the Junsui, like purity, means in this sense. Um, but uh, that scene, the, the performance where the fan is, you know, having some kind of episode, um, you start to wonder, like, are, are the girls possessed? Are they, mm. you know, manifestations of some kind of deity? And I think that movies and mockumentaries about idols have often played with this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of other movies, um, the uh, Jisatsu Sakura, Suicide Circle, um, you know, uses the idea of the song that brainwashes people into committing suicide and kind of plays with the idea that idols are brainwashing people. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one uh, starring AKB48, which is a Densen Uta, um, which is also, you know, like uh, the, uh, about a song, like a, a song that brainwashes people. Um, and even uh, movies like Ghost Theater, which has a former AKB48 member as a star, 
kind of play with the idea of youth and purity mm -hmm. as a form of ritual sacrifice or something. Um, so I feel like in a weird way, these movies don't go quite so far as to critique idol culture. They don't quite take that extra step of saying, hey, maybe this is actually quite damaging and creepy. Um, but they kind of dance on the line of that. And I think that um, there are parts of Shirome as well that just sort of tiptoe up to the idea that, that maybe this is all a little bit uh, problematic <laughs> and dangerous. So I was gonna follow up with that. And I, I'm wondering, is Shiraishi, is he, is he doing a little bit of a critique here? I mean, this yeah. is supposed to be in some ways a vehicle for this group, Exactly, but... it is, yeah. And, and I think in a way he is, I think that it's very odd. And I've, I've looked at this a little bit with uh, Ghost Theater and um, some other uh, AKB48 vehicles where my, my ultimate conclusion is maybe a little bit pessimistic, <laughs> which is that, um, Akimoto Yasushi, the guy who, who created uh, AKB48 and a bunch of other mm -hmm. idol groups, and a, a couple of people like him are, you know, these sort of Svengali-like figures uh, who love to be perceived as the puppet masters who kind of control all of these groups. And so, and even uh, stuff that Akimoto himself has supervised has had this little bit of critique in it. But what I feel like is happening there is basically, it's sort of like when people criticize Facebook on Facebook. Um, <laughs> it's like, he just kind of wants to control everything. So he's even controlling the critique of his own creation. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he has to be completely aware of everything that is in these films um, and, you know, the sort of subtext and, and things like that. I don't think any of it is an accident. So on the one hand, yes, I think there's a critique happening. On the other hand, I think it's happening with the full knowledge and consent uh, mm -hmm. of the people who hold the power in these, uh, you know, idol agencies and idol institutions. So it's not like it's affecting actual change. <laughs> um, it's just, it's critique <laughs> as if to say, oh, isn't this intriguing? Now let's continue just the way we were before. We're not actually going right. to change it. Thing. Right. Is it actually social critique if it's sanctioned by the powers yeah. that be, right? <laughs> right. Can't you, you know, but master's tools, master's house, that sort of thing. I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That gets us into some murky waters. But um, speaking <laughs> yeah. of murky waters, so we, we potentially have this um, signed off critique that's happening on the surface, we'll, we'll say. Um, that's, I, I guess, made to either make you think or make the film seem more legitimate, perhaps, like give it some gravitas or something. Um, but as we know, horror functions to expose these underlying uh, social anxieties that sometimes the filmmaker didn't even um, realize <laughs> might be the case. Um, and maybe that's about the purity of, of 12 year old girls performing for audiences on the one hand. Um, but do you, what, what sort of against the grain um, moral panic or social anxieties do you find that are sort of embedded in Shido Man? So I think that a lot of J-horror is about loss of control mm -hmm. um, and losing a sense of what is real and what is illusion. Um, so basically the, the dawning realization that you don't, you no longer have control over your own mind, mm. um, is, is a really frightening thing that happens in a lot of J-horror. And that is frequently connected to mental health issues or social, social isolation. And those particular words are never used. Um, in, in a lot of these movies, you have people who are clearly suffering from depression or mm. anxiety, um, but they don't use those words. Uh, right. It's usually just, you know, oh, this person hasn't been doing very well, or, you know, we need to check on them or something. Or in some cases, it's like they're possessed <laughs> or they're dealing with ghosts. <laughs> um, but I feel like uh, the root fear here um, in, in a movie like Shirome is perhaps mm -hmm. a loss of control um, mm -hmm. and uh, a loss of, you know, oh, is this all in my head? Is this real? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, just the kind of overwhelming feeling of uh, helplessness. And um, mm -hmm. I think that probably a lot of young audiences in Japan can relate to that these days because uh, they're dealing with, uh, even before COVID, <laughs> um, they were dealing with uh, a lot of issues in terms of, you know, finding a job, finding a relationship, uh, you know, kind of fitting in uh, with the sort of benchmarks of society 
that left a lot of people feeling really helpless, um, mm. that left them feeling like certain things were just always going to be beyond their control uh, and they were never going to be able to achieve the the goals that society had set out for them. So yeah, I think that that, that is implicit in a lot of shit as well. Now that you say that, I'm thinking about to some of the dialogue that's, that gets repeated throughout the film. And it is, it's part of the giveaway that this is scripted, that even those yeah. con- those confessions mm-hmm. are, are, are scripted in the sense that we never hear a very classic ano or eto throughout, I think, the mm-hmm. entire film. Right? There's never right. an um or a mm-hmm. <laughs> So, yeah. so you know that they have these lines that are planned, planned yeah. out and have been, in fact, rehearsed. Yeah. But you, you get these kind of fake repetitive uh, mm-hmm. reactions, right? And it, the three mm-hmm. that stand out to me are the yada, 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 yada. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. No, no, mm-hmm. no, no, this is bad, this mm-hmm. is bad. Muni, 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 this is impossible, right? Mm-hmm. And then yamete, 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 mm-hmm. like, please, mm-hmm. please stop. Mm-hmm. And although those are very common, you know, reactions in a way, the... Mm-hmm. The way that they're repeated so often and that those are the canned reactions, it does, those, those are about control, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is bad, this is impossible, and stop. <laughs> those yeah. are very much reactions of, of yeah. lack of control, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and also just, I think you, you make the point that there's no eto, there's no ano, no. <laughs> um, anything like that. I think the the acting style uh, mm. in this film. I I don't know exactly you know to what extent there was a script uh, or to what extent the girls uh, you know read their lines. My guess is that Shiraishi had a uh, you know an outline, um, mm. and and as with so much uh, found footage horror or reality television, that there was a prompt and there was a description, but that the actual words are their own. And mm. the only reason I say that is that in general, if you look at like Seishun Ega sort of youth films or any mainstream Japanese film that is marketed toward um, a young audience, uh, you know, like a teen high school drama or something, uh, the acting style is quite different. <laughs> uh, it tends to be very over the top, very performative. Uh, people are very obviously reading lines. Mm. Uh, the, the lines themselves are often very stilted. Uh, they don't feel like things that an actual human would say. <laughs> um, so that's another big difference with Shirome is that for the most part, I do feel like these are people having conversations. Ah. Um, you know, mm-hmm. even even if uh, there's a prompt, even if it was planned ahead, it doesn't have that stilted feeling to mm-hmm. me, at least compared with a lot of, uh, again, scripted uh, mainstream films. Right. But um, right. yeah, the... They- uh, Oh, sorry. No, I mean, they speak in unison sometimes, mm-hmm. so that, that, that right. part's going to be scripted. But you're right. right. But they sound like young kids. They yes. sound like, they sound right, like, so it doesn't, yeah. They sound like young girls. And the unison thing, too, I think is just, again, part of their idol persona. Right. Um, that, that's right. just, you know, that when they do their little self introductions uh, in, <laughs> in the bus, you could, I mean, yeah, they, they have done that probably thousands of times right so right. it's not necessarily something that was scripted for the film it's something they would do on a saturday yeah uh, they do wherever it. they were yeah. <laughs> like they just it's they just part of their the routine time. i don't know if, if this came up in your research at all because you have his fake documentary book <laughs> there um do you get the sense that they did multiple takes or do you feel that this was mostly a one take based on what i know about shiraishi's uh shooting process mm. i think it's pretty likely that they didn't do a lot of takes. <laughs> okay. um, he, on the one hand, he is almost always working with limited budgets. Here, I'm guessing he had a bigger budget because he was working with Stardust Promotions, which is, you know, a much mm. larger agency. Um, but I think what I've seen of Shiraishi, it's not only the budget issue, I think he just prefers it that way. Mm. Um, he likes the takes to be kind of rough. So, I'm sure that there was some rehearsal. I'm sure that, you know, some things, if, you know, a, like camera fell down or something, then uh, maybe they did it again. But I don't know. I, I have a feeling that he didn't do a lot of multiple takes, but yeah, hard to know, but that would be my guess. So let's get back to some of these uh, underlying um issues uh, culturally. We have not yet talked about gender. <laughs> we have in a way. <laughs> um, we have not yet talked about gender. So. You, what are what are we to make of this film that's clearly pushing young girls into um, 
circumstances that are well beyond their comfort level and that they just, they just keep saying, I want to go home or they save me. Right. Um, and they just keep wanting the situation to stop. There's an element when I watch it, um, where, you know, it's kind of like just a horror film or it's hilarious. I found this one very funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny at times, yeah. <laughs> but then there's also just almost, there's there's like only so much I can take of listening to a chorus of young girls telling yeah. me that, that they want um, this to stop. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a masochism level to it. So yeah. I, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> it, it really is. It's like, I mean, I as I watch it, I know it's fake. I know it, you know, these girls are not actually in any real danger. And I think they know that too. Mm. But still, the, the image of these, again, very young. Some of, I think some of them are 13. And like these very young girls in this, you know, very stressful situation and just crying and shrieking. And so much of the movie is just yeah. them crying and screaming. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, it, it, it connects to uh, something that you see in a lot of horror, which is terrified young women. Um, so it's not new in that sense. But um, I think it, it comes back to this idea of gaman um, mm -hmm. or, you know, persevering within idol culture where so much of idol culture is about suffering. We, we don't really talk about that because I, I think the image of idol culture is that it's just perky and happy and shiny all the time. But these young women really suffer. And it, with, in, in recent years with uh, certain like high profile cases of assault or, or even suicide or, or idols being attacked by deranged fans, mm -hmm. um, the, the veil is kind of being lifted a little bit and on some issues that people didn't really want to talk about before. And I think what we're seeing is that, first of all, um, they're hardly exploited. Uh, these are, you know, young girls who are being made to work ridiculously long hours. They have often signed really exploitative contracts uh, that effectively are a kind of indentured servitude. Um, they have to stand for hours and hours at these handshake events. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about how, you know, they have chronic pain because of it. Uh, but again, they don't talk about this because you're never supposed to complain as an idol. You're supposed to be grateful uh, for all right. of this. And so I feel like in Shirome, yet again, we see these girls gamaning. We see them persevering through this very uh, difficult situation because they don't want to let anyone down. They don't want yeah. to. And, and you know, the, 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 the adults say that repeatedly. It's like, you know, we, we have to finish this. This is, you know, we have a deadline. We got to get this done. Um, and also there's the idea that, you know, they have a goal, they have a dream and they have mm. to see it through. Mm. Um, and so, again, even though it's, it's staged, it's still disturbing. And I think more than anything, if we go back to the gender issue, it, it just feeds into the idea that these very young women are commodities mm. um, and that fans are entitled to their suffering mm. in a weird way. Um, mm. Because I think that the, the suffering idol or the, you know, the struggling idol is, is a, very much a part of this. And the idea is that the fan is the cheerleader or the supporter who helps to build them up. And, and therefore, the idol owes the fan, you know, a handshake and attention. And it just, you know, feeds into the, the much larger problem of, of women as commodities or men being entitled to the attention, the affection, the devotion of very young <laughs> women. Right. Um, right. So yeah, that, that aspect of it cannot be ignored. There's a lot to think about uh, there. There's this all this hidden labor, which you've, you've the hidden labor that goes into the perseverance. So, you know, the, the idea of gaman, gamarimas, mina no tamini gambarimas, like you do always doing it for other people, fan no tamini gambarimas. So, mm -hmm. um, but the actual labor of the perseverance is erased, right? Yes. So, and, and that's part of the commodity aspect of it. Um, yeah. And how yeah. perseverance has been commodified. <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. And, Pe Patrick yeah. Albright has talked a little bit about this too, specifically with the idea of love um, and mm. uh, the way that love is used within idol culture. And specifically when uh, the members of AKB48 are all campaigning, you know, mm. to, for the mm. election where you know, right. fans vote for the top people. 
um, they specific, the, the girls specifically say, your votes are your love. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you show us love through voting and then the, but then the work of idols is often described as a labor of love. Right. So right. it's, you know, you're, you're, you're doing it because you love it. You're not doing it, you know, to get endorsement deals or to make money. You're doing this because <laughs> you, you love your fans and you love yeah. this work. But yes, in the midst of that, the actual labor, the backbreaking, mind-numbing labor of endlessly smiling and shaking hands and promoting yourself and going on endless it hurts. TV shows. <laughs> it hurts. It's painful. Yeah. It, it yeah. gets erased and it, it just becomes about, oh, they love me. They're doing this for love. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Nina Gawa Mika spoke about this in an interview not too long ago and was you know, she's one of the only female film directors that openly talks about being a female film director. And so she's very honest about the labor that goes behind, yeah. um, that goes into that. And she was actually saying that she looks up to these idols, which she has to shoot uh, frequently for photography shoots. And, mm -hmm. and she talks about how hard they work and how their work is backbreaking. And I think Nina Gawamika works very hard. So for her oh, to yeah. say <laughs> that um, she's admiring these 14 year old girls is yeah, yeah. this really interesting peek behind the curtain that we don't often, oh, we don't often get. Um, <laughs> so on the topic of, of sort of Gaman and Gambaru um, and, the, and linking that to this age group, it seems not a, um, coincidence to me that the surprise reveal location that they're taken mm -hmm. to is of course a school they're not taken mm -hmm. to a hospital they're not taken to an abandoned shrine uh, they are taken to a dilapidated school so um, would you like to speak at all about the, <laughs> the role uh, it's telling that uh so many contemporary japanese ghost stories take place in schools um, there is a whole series, the Gakko no Kaidan, or School mm. Ghost Stories series, which is, uh, was a series of books, um, which became uh, comic books, which became movies, um, which is just a collection of ghost stories that have been told by children and adults for decades uh, that take place in schools. Um, mm. You know, there's Toire no Hanako-san, Hanako of the <laughs> Toilet, which is about a, a ghostly girl who appears in the girl's bathroom at the school. Um, mm -hmm. There are, you know, stories about haunted classrooms. There's, uh, you know, ghosts of, of uh, teachers or something that, that haunt the building. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, no coincidence <laughs> that, that Shinomei would choose uh, to set this, this big set piece in a school because um, as certainly for a lot of young viewers, mm -hmm. um, a, an abandoned schoolhouse is, is kind of naturally a spooky place. Um, and I think there's also just an inherent creepiness to a space that's associated with brightness and youth being abandoned and decrepit. Uh, so, you know, it, it, and it kind of, it's yet again, I feel like a sort of subtle critique of the idol <laughs> industry. <laughs> where, ah. you know, you have these girls who are, uh, are supposed to always be on and, and, you know, shiny and cheerful and happy, but maybe they're actually dead inside. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> a bit far perhaps but and then they graduate and that's what happens yeah, but then they graduate but but i mean not, maybe not they're not individually dead inside but the the whole system is a bit rotten <laughs> inside um so uh and i mean even uh, on on another level i think uh the abandoned school for me just calls to mind the ever looming threat of japan's declining birth rate <laughs> um ah. where uh, this has been a news story for quite some time now the fact that there are so many abandoned schools uh, mm -hmm. in rural areas in japan because there just aren't enough kids uh right. for the schools so the schools you know uh, end up being unused and they just kind of sit there derelict um so uh that that image is is powerful i think it's you know it's a classic spooky place with lots of ghost stories associated with it and it's connected to some kind of real world uh yeah. dread <laughs> as well yeah which i think it's interesting to me because i think of uh, you know a lot of hollywood horror is domestic horror so with horror set in the home um, the, the, the troubled domestic family, domesticity, X, Y, Z. Um, and we, of course, have that in Japanese horror as well, especially in the kind of early heydays of it. We have quite a lot of domestic horror. Um, but this to me is different, is the, the haunted school is a little, maybe we do have that maybe more in literature, I suppose, and in, in, in oral, um, 
in oral storytelling. Um, but I, I like it <laughs> because we're so used to seeing the school as, as the Seishun Ega of youth romance and yeah. uh, nostalgia. And, um, you know, it's hard, uh, but that's where your true, um, your true meaning of life is. And so yeah. just totally subvert it in some way I find to be um, sort of delicious in its own way. <laughs> and if it's linked to such um, difficult social issues, we should yeah. say. One, one more question. I've been thinking a lot about sound recently in, in various um, genres. Um, and I was thinking about, okay, this is a, this is a group about a musical group of young women who are trying to eventually be more famous and then eventually sing in a large competition at the end of the year. Um, and I, once I started thinking about sound in the film, I was like, oh, this, this is quite lyrical, actually. The crying, you know, there's kind of like a rhythm and a cadence to the crying and the mm -hmm. screaming, certainly. We have lots of chanting that happens in here. The, the repetition of those words I already, already mentioned is kind of like its own song in, in some ways. The practice self-introductions, I think we both um, rather like. <laughs> in the unison dialogue. So I was wondering, you know, have have you thought about sound in this film? Yeah, I think, you know, sound is so important in found footage horror. Um, mm. It's such an important component of how it scares you or how it creates atmosphere. Um, I think in particular, in so many found footage horror films, there's often no real score. Uh, there's no, no background music, so that's, you, you rely much more than usual on incidental noises and maybe even repeated noises. Um, and I think in, in found footage horror, of course, there's the cinema verite element where uh, certain sounds like uh, camera clicking or heavy breathing or muffled speaking um, are not edited out. Uh, so, you know, that uh, contributes to the kind of atmosphere of authenticity. Um, and then there are also just random noises that are never really explained, mm -hmm. uh, that where maybe you don't see the ghost or the scary thing, but you hear something. I think the Blair Witch Project is obviously so much about noise. Um, we never see anything in the Blair Witch Project. We mm -hmm. only hear things. Um, so that's really important. Um, and yeah, in, in this film, there are so many sounds that repeat. Uh, and it, it becomes almost like uh, it, there is actually chanting in the film uh, at one point, um, and it, the the repetition of certain sounds becomes kind of like a chant uh, mm -hmm. of you know just the the, the muri, the nande, the yada, all, all that kind of thing, the the singing, the shrieking, <laughs> the crying, um, and uh, it it all combines, um, so we, we have all of those noises and then the actual songs, uh, the, the girls actually singing, it, it all adds up to a really jarring soundtrack uh, that mixes spooky noises with relentlessly cheerful and upbeat singing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to produce this kind of, I don't know if I would call it like an anti-musical <laughs> where, because like it's not, it. <laughs> yeah, it's, or a horror musical, like it's not quite a musical, it has some singing in it, but mm. it, it has a really fascinating soundscape um, yeah. that, you know, is, is just this, this mix of incidental noise and ghostly noise and singing and perky self-introductions. Um, and I think it is designed to be uncomfortable, uh, mm -hmm. to, to make, to be jarring because one minute you know, we're peace signing and dancing around and the next minute, you know, we're, we're shrieking or, or something yeah. like that. So you never know quite what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do have one more final question for you. And that is, <laughs> as we, we started at the top of this by acknowledging that the found footage Japanese horror film is really circulated domestically and hasn't really found its place, I think, internationally. Um, are there other found footage titles that you would recommend for people who are sort of now hooked on <laughs> <laughs> the young other, <laughs> other other Japanese found footage horror yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean I think Shiraishi is kind of the king okay. <laughs> of this. Um he has made a lot of found footage horror films. Um and uh I think the, the other one that I find really there are two that I find really interesting. One is called Occult, um Okarto occult. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is Noroi, the curse. Mm -hmm. um, so those two, I think, uh, raise similarly interesting questions about reality and authenticity. They're also funny. Um, he, he, you know, has kind of a tongue-in-cheek sense of humor. He's also made some really disturbing films. So I, I, I won't say just go out and, and watch all of Shiraishi because uh -huh. uh, 
some of his stuff is is a bit rough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but those two those those two films, I can honestly say they're you know they raise some kind of disturbing questions, but there isn't particularly graphic imagery or, or anything okay. that's really disturbing in there. Beyond Shiraishi, um, there are a couple of other interesting ones. Um, there's actually a Japanese a version of Paranormal Activity uh, called Paranormal Activity Tokyo Night, uh, okay. which is essentially, you know, very similar premise and very similar style, but, you know, kind of puts its own spin on things. Uh, so that was neat. Um, there's another very famous one called POV, A Cursed Film. Mm. Um, so POV, Noroareta Film, uh, which I think is uh, Norio Suruta. Um, and it also features uh, an idol um, subplot. Uh, it's two actresses, in this case, they're not actually idols. It's two actresses who are playing idols and they end up watching uh, some sort of cursed videotape and you know, it haunts them and things like that. And that one also has a lot of uh, the, the tone of, you know, I know this is scary, but you have to finish this or you're gonna let your agency down or <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that. Um, so, yeah, there, there are a couple of other kind of low-budget ones. I, I, I noticed in particular that a lot of kind of pop idol horror vehicles tend to be found footage style, mm -hmm. uh, maybe just because it's cheap and it's easy um, mm -hmm. and y the girls get the chance to basically play versions of themselves. Um, there's one, uh, I think it's called Hitori Kakurembo, which is like hide and seek alone, which also mm -hmm. takes place in a school. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just kind of girl, <laughs> girls walking around filming scary things in a school. Um, so yeah, so the, the, I guess the main ones I would recommend for Shiraishi are Occult and The Curse, and then maybe also a POV, A Cursed Film, and uh, The Paranormal Activity, Tokyo Night, if you're interested in another episode of the Paranormal Activity series. Well, I will also take your warning to heart seriously, because for, if two, <laughs> if two fans of horror say this is rough, then... <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I'm I am a fan of horror. I am honestly not a fan of violence. Uh, for me, uh, horror, I, the horror films I tend to enjoy tend to be ones that are focused more on suspense and atmosphere. I am not, you know, a fan of endurance cinema. Yeah. <laughs> Which, um, so yeah, and, and for the most part, Shidaishi's films I would say are, are very atmospheric. But he has dabbled a bit in. Uh, the graphic stuff, which I honestly am just a slasher genre. In. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lindsay, so much for talking with me today. Uh, thank you for having me. And construction <laughs> in, in film and in the idol industry and identity and bringing all of those things together. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I love getting to talk about horror. <laughs>